for faculty only. It is open to students, staff, faculty, and during COVID to anyone who has Zoom. So please spread the word. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Carla Marcantonio, who's the Associate Professor of Film and Television in Media Studies in our School of Film and TV. And she will um, introduce our tonight's speaker. So take it away, Carla. Thank you, Rhonda, and welcome everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Anupama Kapse, to today's gathering of Faculty Pub Night. Professor Kapse is an associate professor in the Department of Film, TV, and Media Studies in the School of Film and Television. She holds a PhD in Film Studies from the University of California, Berkeley, and a master's degrees both from Film Studies and English Literature from Berkeley and from the University of New Delhi, respectively. She is a versatile scholar whose expertise falls in the areas of Indian cinema, silent cinema, melodrama, and star studies. Her co-edited collection with Jennifer Bean and Laura Horak, Silent Cinema and the Politics of Space, won the Society for Cinema and Media Studies Award for Best Edited Collection in the Field in 2015. It has since also been reprinted in India in 2017. Her essays on Indian cinema, film stars, and melodrama have appeared in prestigious journals such as Framework, South Asian Popular Culture, and Film Quarterly. Her current monograph, from which she will be presenting today, Film is Body Politic, Indian Cinema, The Early Years, promises to be a landmark study, not just in Indian cinema, but also in studies of early cinema and in the field of melodrama studies. The book is under advanced contract at Indiana University Press. The book builds a history of Indian early cinema that investigates the cultural industrial forces that led not only to the birth of the Indian film industry, but also addresses how this industry eventually became the largest producer of films in the world. Professor Copps's work that built from her ex exquisitely nuanced readings of texts aims to dissect the intertwining of narrative and its cinematic aesthetics with the historical, the technological, and the political. Melodrama is a key element that she employs in her elucidations, something that both invigorates historical approaches to film study, as well as approaches to genre criticism. Most importantly, Professor Copps's work pushes the methodology of melodrama beyond its predominantly Eurocentric paradigms. I am much looking forward to seeing this book in print. At LMU, Professor Copps is currently teaching courses in Indian cinema and the history of cinema prior to 1945, she also teaches our foundational course in film and media theory, as well as a first year seminar on cities and cinema. Please join me in welcoming Anupama Kapse to launch this academic year's faculty pub night. Hi everybody. Uh, it is uh, with great pleasure that I am doing this talk today and a big warm thank you to the library, uh, to Rhonda, to John, to Carol, the entire library staff and Carla for that lovely introduction. I hope I can live up to it. <laughs> um, and uh, this book has been in the making for many years and uh, it's, wonderful to kickstart um, the uh, faculty pub night with this because I'm returning to this material after a little bit of a gap and it's it's been very very instructive uh, from the one question that I want to ask and I know students from both of my classes are there today so the one question that I want to ask today is how did the cinema originate in India and uh, let me see if I'm able to share my screen. Uh, just give me a moment while I do that. Right, uh, so hopefully you can see my screen and uh, it's a little, Odd to see my own picture, but uh, 
the library did this wonderful poster that I had to share with all of you. So here it is. And I am talking about the early years today. And uh, the first image here that I want to show you is what the film industry looked like uh, before it was an industry. So the British, of course, controlled all aspects of production. And they were very much using the camera to uh, or um, to collect information. Um, and this is actually from a film they made and these films are known as topicals that would be shown um, in uh, along with a feature, usually a British feature. And it was very much about maps and surveys and kind of reducing India to something that was very, very condensed. Um, and uh, a big part of this was imperial spectacle. This is the Delhi Darbar from 1911. I don't have shots of uh, the color version that Kodachrome did of this, but I do want to refer to it here. As you can see, everything is very militarized. Everything is very uniform. And that was very much a part of the imperial aesthetic. And they were very much the panoramas of empire and uh, evoked images of mastery over space and also the people of India. And as you can see from this photograph, when you do see the natives, quote unquote, brown people, uh, they're very tiny, you can barely see them and they're a starfish uh, merely there to give you an idea that this is in fact a picture of India and the possession of the wealth of India that you can see in the background there in the buildings is very much at the forefront and the natives are very, very diminished. And again, I'm putting natives in quotes. So a big challenge for filmmakers was how to put the natives up front and center and I'm beginning with a documentary or a topical or, you know, they were known by a variety of names, but this is a, a kind of an actuality that D.G. Falke, who was uh, the equivalent of D.W. Griffith in India, made, and it is about bricklaying. And you can see the difference in the way in which a brown subject is presented. Uh, I'll leave you to first watch this clip. So let me play the clip. This is 1922, Brickley. There's no sound, but I do want you to notice the pan here. It's almost a circular pan, probably taken from that machine that you just saw. The camera must have been mounted to that. So this is a very different panorama, in other words, than the panorama of the imperial spectacle that uh, we just had a glimpse of from the Delhi Darbar. And like Edison, Falke very much saw himself as a pioneer of the Indian film industry. And I do want to compare Edison at work in his own laboratory with Falke. So that's my next clip. Uh, so watch this. It has sound.
And this is Falke at Work, uh, How Films Are Made, 1917. Since there's no sound, I'm going to talk over this clip. Uh, you can see that Falke pretty much turns the camera on himself. And we might even say that this is a uh, sign of vanity, but I would like to think that this is because he doesn't have access to the kind of big laboratory that Edison had access to. So having uh, missed, uh, not having access to those facilities, what Palke does is to turn the camera on himself. And the focus here is on the narrative aspects of film and uh, not so much on the technology because that was the one thing that Indians didn't really have access to because the British was still ruling India. And uh, you can see that uh, this is shot at home uh, you could even think of this as a home video because Falke shoots pretty much like we would be shooting uh, with our own phones right now, turning the camera on himself, uh, turning the camera uh, also on his own home space. So this is uh, his first film. Um, it's Raja Harishchandra. And uh, what what is very striking about all of these images is the frontality of these images, the way in which, because of the, um, the difference from the imperial aesthetic, Indian subjects are literally placed front and center. I'm not so interested in the story here as in the question of what do people do when they get access to cameras? They, in fact, put themselves uh, front and center, and you might want to think of Oscar Michaud and the differences between Griffith and Michaud when uh, Michaud uh, has access to the camera. We should also remember that these cameras were not very sophisticated. Sometimes they were very crudely manufactured in India. They were imported. Sometimes uh, film stock was very, very expensive. But nevertheless, um, though the film stock may have been imported, Falke very often referred to his films as Swadeshi films or homemade or self-made films. And that's what you get to see here. So let me show a very small part of it. Okay, that's enough. And since I was talking about frontality, I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of what that might be. And we often think of uh, examples in Western cinema when the actor looks directly at the screen as the breaking of the fourth wall. But that was integral to the way films were made in India. And here you see uh, a little uh, glimpse of uh, Falke's daughter, Mandakini Falke. She's playing Krishna in his 1919 film, um, uh, Kalya Mardan, or The Death of Kalya. And there is no pretense of uh, the illusion having to be maintained. Rather, the illusion has to be broken because people have to know that this is Falke's daughter playing this actor, and she talks directly to the audience. Again, we might want to think of this as you know, being very theatrical because this is a convention uh, from uh, Indian plays, stage plays from which the cinema was adapted. But uh, and notice how she looks directly at us here. That is what people did when they got access to the camera. Frontality is not just something that is uh, a carryover from the theater, but it becomes a strategy, uh, a strategy uh, with which to develop the language of cinema. And that's the question I'm asking here. Why frontality? Because several critics have drawn attention to frontality as being very central to the uh, visual codes of Indian cinema. But why is what I'm asking here? And it has something to do with 
uh, uh, learning how to use the camera and setting up a language of cinema. I now turn to my second example, which is Sukanya Sabitri. This is 1922. This is not Falke. Uh, this is uh, made by the uh, Kohinoor Film Company. And uh, it's very, very interesting, this film, because it's about a woman. Uh, the story is taken from Indian mythology. Uh, Sabitri is the name of the woman. She, in fact, rests her dead husband back from the god of death. So here's the link and, you know, students of Indian cinema who are here, uh, you should um, make a note of this because this is a repository of Indian cinema that uh, you uh, should uh, know about because it has several of these films. Uh, hopefully you're, you all are able to uh, watch this without a problem. There we go. And uh, full screen. Hopefully. So this is that moment where her husband has been killed and uh, Savitri has literally snatched him back from the jaws of death. And she's now telling him that I brought you back from the jaws of death. And the reason why I'm playing this is because I'm going to show you a remake of the same story uh, in uh, another clip. Again, it's a very, very short clip, but let's see. Sorry. Just give me a moment to exit full screen. My presentation. So here's this is Sukanya Savitri made in 1922, and then there's Sati Savitri, which is made by Babu Rao Painter in 1927. And it's the same image in the first one. Uh, you see Savitri talking to Yama, the god of death, and that little flame that you see uh, in the uh, um, middle uh, right of the screen is her husband's soul. So she's actually kind of taking that back from the god of death. And in the second image, bottom right, uh, the serpent of death is hovering over her husband. And here's what Babura Painter does with this story, uh, notice how within the space of five years, uh, there's such a huge difference in the way the film is made. Okay, very much, this is sort of my best clip. So that's what I was trying to show. Okay, so this is Savitri. She knows her husband is going to die. She knows the God of death is waiting for him. And uh, she's actually not let him out of her sight. He's come to the forest to cut wood and she doesn't want him to die, but that's exactly what happens. So this tree falls on him and he is almost dead. I'll let you watch that for a little while. But you can imagine that she's saying, I don't want you to die. I am not going to let you die.
Okay, so that's actually the fragment. Uh, that's where the film ends, what survives of it rather. But you do know from the intertitle that Savitri is able to bring her husband back. And the reason why I um, played that is because Barbara Painter, between the 1922 version of this film and they're made by different film companies, uh, one is the Koinur Film Company, which made the most films uh, between 1922 and uh, 29 during the silent era, most of those films were destroyed in a fire and this is the one film that survives. So it's really precious. So that's the Kohinoor Film Company. And then you have Baba Rao Painter who uh, makes the same film for the Maharashtra Film Company with different actors, but very much the same story. And the reason why I am showing both films together is because in the space of five, years. Both films are very, very accomplished, but what Barbara Painter does is to introduce the codes of Western realism into the film. So there's three quarters framing. There's also um, a perspectival realism. Uh, so you don't have the frontality uh, through and through, as you see in Falke. Kanjibai Rator has already started to experiment with that. But by the time in 1927, you come to Painter, we've got cross-cutting, we've got uh, rapid editing, many of the techniques that are in evidence in uh, Hollywood, uh, what we now call Hollywood, but uh, American cinema have been recognized and have been incorporated into the film. And the reason why this is so significant is because that helps me to return to the question of frontality. So what happens to frontality? I don't think frontality disappears. That's the answer. What happens is that you have miracles, you have the codes of frontality, and you also have the codes of Western realism that enter into a dialogue with each other. This is really important because of the uh, issue that I raised at the very beginning of this presentation, uh, which is a Western technology. If technology is Western, then the codes of Western realism must also be suspect. And um, because of these uh, pressure points, it's very interesting to see Sati Savitri as an example of Indian filmmakers making their own cameras, you know, wrestling with the codes of Western realism and turning, you know, all of those things together into something very, very new. And um, it's, a, it's very interesting that we don't have the kind of trajectory that we have in American cinema. People start with scenics or topicals and then they move to narrative cinema. Rather, it's the opposite. We start with narrative cinema in India and that's why frontality is so significant. And then we move to some of these other um, techniques which are introduced once the ground is laid for narrative cinema. Um, because uh, those modes are, you know, they're too contaminated by, um, the, by the, the imperial spectacle and the panoramas of imperial splendor that I was talking about. So it becomes very important to distinguish this aesthetic. Um, and I, I want to end with uh, the body politic. Uh, now, this would be Foucault's definition of the body politic. Um, the state, you know, as a collective body of people, a set of material elements and techniques that serve as weapons, uh, relays, communication routes and supports for the power and knowledge relations that invest human bodies and subjugate them by turning them into objects of knowledge. Now, that's what we were seeing in the imperial panoramas. That's what we were seeing with the opening slides that I uh, showed at the beginning. What we see with Falke and with Rator and with Babu Rao Painter is a return to the body itself as a site of the political, the body itself as a site of emotion. So frontality is something I uh, talked about. I also want to discuss 
the reciprocity of the gaze. Uh, this is very, very significant. This is, uh, it's a practice that reappears in several films from this period. There's a way in which this reciprocity becomes a way of kind of looking directly into the eye of the audience. And by frontality then, what I mean is a direct connection with the audience. And that is done through the body, through, uh, through a, a kind of marking of frontality as the site of the intimate and the affective in a way that the codes of Western realism are not. So I want to end with that, on that note, just to see uh, here, uh, these three images I made a little collage here, where you can see, for example, three quarters framing here, but also the codes of frontality at work. And I'm not just talking about miracles and special effects from the mythologicals, rather it's a kind of churning of all of these codes of cinema that are traveling globally uh, into India uh, in order to generate narrative codes that will stay with Indian cinema for years to come. Thank you. So thank you so much for that wonderful uh, presentation. There's so much about Indian cinema that I do not know, that's for sure. Um, and I would love to take one of your classes and learn more. Um, I know that we have put a lot of films in the library's collection for you, so students can uh, certainly be looking at them. Um, I would like to just chat with you and have a few more questions from the outreach team um, before we open it up to the audience at large. Uh, I urge anybody who has a question to please use the Q&A button um, and uh, we will compile, the outreach team will compile your questions and they will send them to me and then I will ask at the end of this. Uh, also, I did want to remind all of you that we are indeed recording this evening's performance um, and it will be available on the library's YouTube channel, so no fear. So, uh, Anu. I have a question. In a 2015 article that you wrote for the South Asian popular culture, you reflected on the cent centenary of Indian film and on that anniversary's ability to, quote, reanimate celluloid history for a contemporary audience. You close by saying, quote, the challenge is to identify and mark the small footprints it leaves on the margins of official historiography. So the question is, in the half decade since you wrote this, are those small footprints being recognized? Where can students and scholars look for these stories? It's a great question. Thank you for reading uh, my work so carefully. <laughs> God and I had written that. <laughs> but, uh, I, I really appreciate that question. Uh, so this is one site uh, I want everybody to know about. You can watch pretty much all of the silent films that survive from India. It's a very small number, but several of them are available here. So uh, this is, you know, the small footprint. Uh, and then um, I, I do believe um, that um, one has to look. It's never been more true then now, uh, the likelihood of finding these images, these uh, films is actually pretty small. And uh, it's a sad story, but I do want people to know most of these films were melted for silver. So it's not as if the likelihood of finding some lost print in some archive exists, although there are some examples of that as well. The likelihood of falling, uh, finding films from this period is still very, very small. So what we are left with is accounts in newspapers. I showed you one particular image from a newspaper that, that was very, very helpful. And as historians, we have to be very, very creative and attentive to the traces that have been left behind. And often it's not the films themselves, but perhaps other artifacts. And that's the work that I'm doing. 
Are there many memoirs out there of filmmakers from the early period? Yes, um, that's also an excellent question. Um, I'm actually translating a memoir by Shanta Apte. We are watching her film in class next week. Uh, so yes, um, and those are very, very, uh, you know, they're, they're traces and a lot of people uh, suspect them because they rely on memory and memory obviously can be unreliable. And uh, so it's another challenge, but that doesn't mean that we ignore those traces. So the memoir is again, a very, very uh, interesting source because on the one hand, its veracity is doubtful, but on the other hand, uh, once you kind of start to pair it with images from newspapers, which have a higher level of veracity, uh, we can certainly you know, do some very, very creative work using our expertise as historians. Right. So we were curious, so, and not knowing anything that you just told me, our question now is actually a little uh, different, but we were wondering if there was any kind of um, national film archive in India uh, is that, re that you could be doing research in. I mean, it doesn't sound like there would be much there. And, but is there the, you know, the, the yearning to put, do something like that? Yes, uh, so there is the National Film Archive, which was uh, set up by Peek and Iyer in the 1960s. And um, that's, you know, it's a very good repository for a lot of the films. But however, you know, um, it, it's a little bit, um, um, it's, it, there are large parts of uh, the history of cinema that are missing. And while the archive itself has, you know, a checkered history, it's relied on government funding. Uh, and because it's a post-colonial archive, not the kind of funding that the Library of Congress has, um, and that would be a dream if all of the films from Indian cinema were preserved the way the Library of Congress has preserved films from American cinema. Yeah. It's not the same type of repository, however it exists, uh, very much like the British Film Institute uh, and the British Film Archive yeah. as the go-to repository. Yeah. And um, speaking of the British, <laughs> kind of hard to get away from them. So they ruled India until the mid 40s. Um, how did that influence the industry? Like, are there British film characteristics in Indian filmmaking or vice versa? Um, and how do, and, you know, how would we know? How, what, tell us about this. Oh, such wonderful questions. You're asking my dream questions. Um, <laughs> So yes, very much so. Uh, and I talked about a few uh, at the beginning of the uh, presentation. Uh, those are films that are made by the British um, and for consumption actually by uh, uh, the British who were in India at that time. But there were a lot of collaborations. Um, I think it would be remiss of us as historians if we didn't pay attention to those collaborations. And the British, of course, loved them because they had a quota system and that quota system meant that they got a share of the profits. And we have to remember that filmmaking is big business, especially feature filmmaking is big business. And a lot of Indians thought that that was the way to go. I mean, imagine, put, you know, if we put ourselves in their position, they didn't know that India would be independent by 1947. They were pretty much working with the resources they had. And um, um, so those collaborations are also there. Uh, I did not uh, focus on them in uh, today's uh, presentation, but I do have a chapter on them. Uh, and sometimes they, uh, uh, they uh, marketed the films um, in uh, the United Kingdom. They also had the approval of the British government. So the aesthetic of those films is very, very different. And uh, um, I will say that, you know, by the uh, time sound arrived in the 1930s, those films had to reckon with the fact that Indians liked to see themselves on screen and hear sounds from their own country on screen. So they had to reckon with that. So it was for a very brief period that those films uh, came into being. After that, we pretty much have the Indian film industry uh, in the sound era as we know it. I know it was a little bit of a long answer, but uh, I 
did want to refer. Yeah. No, that's great. Films like Light of Asia, for example. Yeah. So we have a lot of questions from the audience. So um, I'm going to take the first one. Um, when did any sort of financing become available to Indian filmmakers? And did that have any effect on the types of films being made? Excellent. Again, I was just talking about uh, Light of Asia. This is uh, a film that was made in 1925 uh, by Himanshu Rai. Uh, and uh, they were relying on, uh, if not patronage, uh, from uh, the British definitely of an official seal of approval. And that meant that the British were opening up, you know, some of the theaters that they thought were good to Indian as well as British audiences. But funding was very, very difficult. This is uh, a, an industry that, you know, is trying to generate capital. It does not have the kind of resources and laboratories uh, in place that, you know, Edison had. So it's sometimes they are relying on royal patronage. Baburat Painter, for example, was relying on the Maharaja of uh, Kolhapur for uh, money. So industrial finance in the way that we think about it is not available to Indian filmmakers. And, and that's part of what they are uh, being very creative about because the whole point of it is to break from the British and the monopoly the British had over all forms of industrial production in India. And my slide, uh, that I showed about uh, Sukanya Savitri, the Krishna Film Company actually has to say that, you know, I'm able to show this film because I got permission from this American, uh, you know, proprietor at the Globe Cinema. Otherwise, you know, Krishna wouldn't have been able to show that film. So uh, in short, finance is uh, not consistently available and people grasp at whatever they're able to find to make the films. And that's why some of these companies are very short-lived. They disappear without a trace. Mm, that's too bad. Um, another question we have is, can you explain the history of the Bollywood musical and maybe how it relates to the ideas of frontality that you've described? Excellent question. Um, um, the musical, is of course, I think very central to the development of melodrama because melodrama is an inherently musical form. And it's in the thirties that people start to experiment with kind of bringing back, now here's where the theater becomes very important. With the coming of sound, people return to the theatrical conventions. Uh, of frontality and songs are often presented, single shot, long take, um, yeah. actors singing in front of the camera, and those things are very much in evidence in the 30s. But of course, um, you know, it's, it's not fun to look at an actor for four or five minutes um, singing without moving. So Indian cinema then has to, especially Bollywood, Bombay cinema, as we refer to it, has to contend with uh, you know frontality and what to do with it uh, once sound arrives. But I will reiterate what I said earlier, which is that uh, frontality is reserved for the most intimate moments, for the most um, you know the the, the big uh, the big spectacular moments also of transformation in a miracle, for example. That's when you see it reappearing. But always frontality is. Uh, has to renegotiate whether it's uh, you know the coming of sound or uh, the arrival of color. Frontality always has to renegotiate codes that are being imported globally from not only American cinema but also um, uh, uh, British films. And the songs then become uh, as experimental as some of the most avant-garde films that we see. Uh, in, uh, uh, in the Euro-American context. Hmm. Thank you. Um, we have another question. What role do you think the cultural practices of darshan, viewing, and puja, reverential offering, influenced early Indian cinema? Again, this is a very nice question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. I, I'm not looking at the chat function because I I am not able to, but uh, I'd love to know 
who's asked that question. Uh, Professor up. Chris Chapel. Oh, nice, nice. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think Darshan is, again, very central to the codes of Indian cinema, narrative cinema as they develop at this time. Um, and I will, again, uh, point to the reciprocity of the gaze. The wonderful thing about Darshan is it is adapted from Hindu rituals and cinema adapted it very quickly. I do have, um, I don't know if I am able to share that screen, but I, I won't, I don't want to waste time. But the, the principle of Darshan is quite simply this. It's like you are praying in a temple and you're looking at the image of God and God returns that gaze because you're worshiping in front of that idol in a temple. And this has implications for cinematic conventions such as shot reverse shot, for example. And you can then use the shot reverse shot to set up the darshanic in cinema. And, and of course, uh, at moments of great distress, um, as you see with Savitri and uh, the god of death, Yama, that's very much shot reverse shot. Of course, it's not the darshanic because Yama represents evil, but in, in a miracle, for example, you could have a god appearing uh, to bring the dead uh, back to life, and, and that would be an application of Darshan. Hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. What? Why do you think that Indian cinema's history is not taught around the world despite Bollywood being such a huge producer of films? That's a good question, too. Yeah, they're all such fabulous. <laughs> questions. I'm so delighted. Uh, so I noticed that movie, now movie has a chapter in India. Movie is now showing a lot of Indian films. Uh, unfortunately, it just became paid. Uh, but in my Indian cinema class, I asked everybody to sign up for movie. That's a great resource. Um, the library, by the way, uh, it films on demand is a great resource. Uh, the films of Guru that are available there. And this is just a way of saying that people are now reckoning with the fact that this is a massive film industry. But you know, I'm a little bit a little tired of that moniker because I'd really like to talk about the contribution of Indian cinema, not just the uh, quantity of it. Uh, so quality-wise, as we are just seeing with Darshan and with all of the songs, which of course are always the most fun part of a class in Bollywood cinema, there is so much experimentation, there is so much originality, and there's so much creativity in the way in which people are able to use the camera. So um, I think people are, in short, waking up to the fact that this is not only the most prolific cinema in the world, but also quality wise, the most one of the most interesting in the world. And it's happening with movie and with films on demand, for example. Excellent. Great. Have a lot to look forward to. Um, okay, let's see. Um, I've recently seen social media discussions about skin color in Indian cinema and pop media, along with a new controversy regarding Beyonce, et cetera. Are you able to comment on these issues, perhaps generally tracing them over the past 100 years on Indian cinema? Wow, that's a big one. Yes, yes. We, we <laughs> I can reread it if you would like me to. It, it's OK, thank you. Uh, I think uh, this is very, very important. Um, this is, you know, I think it has something to do with our colonial past. Um, it has something to do also with, you know, inherent, uh, not just class divisions, but caste divisions in India. And they both, you know, the racism of colonial relations and the exploitative character of caste in India, both of those come together in the way in which skin color has, um, the, the history of skin color has unfolded um, in uh, Indian cinema, not just Bombay cinema, but also South Indian cinema. So lighter skin uh, is generally associated with uh, uh, being a better person or having a better character. 
uh, or definitely it is a feminine ideal in Indian cinema. And this is very, very problematic. And as, you know, as we enter the now the second decade of uh, third decade of the new millennium, uh, people have begun to challenge this. It's not necessarily happening in popular cinema, although there are a couple of examples like Sujata, Bimal Roy Sujata. Uh, some of the smaller films, and as Indian cinema enters this new phase, which is the third phase, the digital phase, and we have network television and we have small films, those are the films to watch out for that uh, are very good, uh, you know, in terms of raising uh, awareness and also questioning some of these long-standing prejudices in Indian cinema. You can always count on the art house films. Those are the ones to watch. Yeah. Let me turn my light on because it's getting dark here. Ooh, that's a nice light. Yeah, that looks great. Um, somebody noticed your uh, Mother India poster and I thought you might want to point it out to people. <laughs> I don't have a Zoom background. <laughs> um, okay, we have another question. How did the spread of Indian cinema compare to the spread of American or British cinema? Was cinema as popular in India as it was in the West? Yes, um, and the answer to that is kind of twofold. Cinema was very popular, but because film acting was considered to be disreputable and the movies were supposed to be too influential. Uh, there's always, you know, it's a very, very split uh, uh, audience. Uh, and often, of course, people would play hooky or lie about going and watching uh, movies. Or sometimes you became an actor or actress that meant breaking ties with your family. So yes, they're very popular. And yes, they're very much in demand, but um, uh, it's not a straightforward uh, uh, history. So, you know, I, I hope that answers the question. Um, and because they're so popular, it became very prolific, but it wasn't recognized for a long time, going back to some of the other questions, because people often thought that popular cinema was very, very trashy. And I also want to add one thing, while you know, there are obviously problems in the history of the cinema, like any other cinema, it's, it's always good to kind of look at specific examples rather than making like a blanket statement about all of Indian cinema. Uh, so I am focusing on uh, the cinema that came out of Bombay and the Western region of India today for that reason. Okay, okay. Um, Indian cinema has transformed since the time period you just talked about. In what ways do you believe Indian cinema and its take on melodrama has changed? Where do you believe it has stayed the same? Yes, um, wonderful question. I think the history of melodrama is still in the making. Uh, it's being made uh, and remade all the time. Um, and this is a moment, I think, where we are uh, questioning some of the practices of melodrama. I think recent Bombay cinema in particular has lost its audience. And that's my answer to why uh, we are not seeing the old type of melodrama that we used to see in the 70s and 80s. That form is now, you know, again, going through a churning because um, and the primary reason for that is because uh, we are not uh, united through certain movements. We're very split, we're very fragmented. And this is the situation um, in, in a lot of parts of the world globally because of the uh, developments that we are seeing globally, whether it's climate change, whether it's the uh, rise of uh, the right, a very powerful right. This has kind of divided the constituency of cinema uh, in, in very pronounced ways. And of course, melodrama has to change too because of the large scale changes that we are witnessing. Um, is the concept of frontality still present in contemporary Indian cinema? Good question. Yes. Yes, um, I would look for uh, songs 
And frontality is also something that uh, experimental filmmakers or Amagat filmmakers will deploy um, in, in a more, you know, as a stylistic choice. So uh, very much so, uh, yes. And uh, I would look, you know, for the most climactic moments in uh, another, this work that I've done on the Tableau is available on YouTube. So Tableau framing is something that is used um, um, a lot with frontality. Uh, a tableau is a, a frozen picture and very often frontality or direct address to the audience in a Brechtian context. All of these are uh, techniques are deployed in order to make a moment stand out, whether it's in a song or whether it's in a feature or sometimes even in uh, television soap opera. So yes, it's very much there. Uh, it's not the only thing, remember, uh, but it, it is something that uh, continues to be in dialogue with some of the new uh, techniques that are uh, being developed in Indian cinema. Hmm. Okay. Um, where were the studios? Were they all over the subcontinent or mainly in the area where Hindu was spoken? Uh, yes, um, studios don't really emerge until the mid 1920s. Uh, Falke did have his own studio. So I, I do want to talk about the silent era because that's the part that is neglected the most. Mm -hmm. um, there was a very similar uh, method that people were using. Falke called his studio the factory and it was a you know, rooftop studio, which meant the roof was open uh, to let natural light in. And uh, he had that studio set it up in Nashik. And Painter was uh, shooting also in Maharashtra. Um, you know, he set up uh, a studio at that time. But the kind of integrated model that we have in uh, the Hollywood context. So that meant uh, a studio like Prabhat, for example, that had its own theaters and uh, you know had contracted stars. That is established in the 1930s. And Dunyana Mane or The Unexpected, the film that uh, we are going to watch in my Indian cinema class on uh, Thursday is very much a part of that. So studios begin to uh, you know, gain strength in the 1930s, but with the end of the war, as the war uh, becomes uh, you know, something that's very disruptive in Europe, that studio system collapses, and then you know, India becomes independent in 1947. And after that, the studios reform. Some of these old studios that emerged during the sound era uh, are seeing their last days in the 1950s. So we have Raj Kapoor Zawara, and we have films like that that uh, uh, come from the RK studios, which again become very, very, uh, very prolific and uh, very well established and continue until the 70s and the 80s, um, uh, and when we again see major transformations. So there are these different phases in studio history. But yes, we start to see the emergence of the studios right from the silent era and different studios have different, uh, different presence, uh, uh, a different presence in the market at different times. Hmm. Okay, we'll take a couple, couple more and then I'll let you go. Um, I love you, stay by the way. <laughs> okay, let me just see, I lost my spot here. Um, let's see, uh, oh gosh, where is it? Okay. Um, so, um, wow, okay. What does the setup of the silent films that you've shared with us help with her in your development of your book? Like, and how, is your how do you do your research when there's so little available? Yes, we have to be very, very creative. Um, and uh, um, I'll, I'll try to be brief, but uh, I found uh, memoirs very useful. I've also found different archives useful, uh, not just uh, the uh, National Film Archive, but the British Film Institute and other, you know, any sort of any possible resource. Sometimes it could be a historian, 
Sometimes it could be a newspaper article. Sometimes it could be, uh, you know, uh, even, uh, and this is something I want to mention, the Margaret Herrick Library. Uh, that's something um, that, you know, is in Los Angeles and right. it might have something. So you never stop looking. And uh, the short answer to that is, you know, you, you sort of grab at whatever you can find <laughs> and you keep collecting. So yeah, in, in some ways I'm a collector and, and that poster is from Ebook Studios, which <laughs> is why I want that poster. You know, I just wanted it to be there today. It's it from the underground collectors group, I bet. So, um, okay, so this is gonna be the last question. So do you see any influence of front frontality in Western filmmaking now? Yes, um, however, uh, you know, it, it really depends. This is something I've been emphasizing. You know, we have to look at the film, each film in its context. And what I find very, very interesting is that it isn't just the experimental filmmakers. It isn't just the silent era. But with the coming of the digital, we are in fact returning to some of the things that were uh, in evidence at the uh, birth, you know, this foundational moment that we were talking about today uh, and whether that means painting over the image we are not just using uh, the camera you know in a sense of in the sense of recording photographic reality but something that can be manipulated something that can be transformed so yes uh, I think those codes are there in um, you know very specific examples but one has to be careful um, and uh, not kind of clump everything together. It's selective and uh, one has to know, you know, use one's expertise and common sense. Fabulous. That's, there's so much, there's so much to know, to learn about Indian cinema. And I have to say that personally, being the media librarian and looking for a lot of these films for you. I've done a lot of searching on the internet and other places. And I, I have to say when I can find them, I do like to um, to play and, and watch some of them. And sometimes I get a little enraptured by them. <laughs> They're just fascinating. So um, I really uh, wanna say thank you so much for this presentation. And, um, and the amount of questions y'all asked were just fabulous. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, John. Thank you. <laughs> so um, to wrap this up, I would like to thank all of you for joining us on this special evening. And of course, thank you uh, to Dr. Anapama Katse. And um, we would also like to thank our Dean, Christine Brancolini, for her continual support of the Hannon Library's fabulous programming. Um, and so I hope you had a lovely time tonight and learned a lot. And I hope that you will all join us next week on Tuesday, September 22nd, again at 5 p.m., when we will feature Professor Sam Pillsbury from the Loyola Law School, who will talk about his very timely book, Imagining a Greater Justice, Criminal Violence, Punishment, and Relational Justice. Uh, and finally, Please take the time to fill out the very short survey that will pop up once you leave the program as it will help us plan and improve our future programming. So again, thank you, Anapama. Thank you, everybody in the audience. Thank you, outreach team. And hope we hope to see you next week. Thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs> and uh, pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.